You are worthy of the honor. <clears throat> You're worthy of the glory. There is nobody like you in all the earth. Thank you for your love today. Thank you for your grace today. Thank you for your truth today. Thank you for who you are in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. Thank you, Father, for your people on today. Thank you, Lord, for your great grace that you deliver to us. Thank you, Father, for the spirit of the living God. Thank you, Abba, that uh, you want to share some of your heart with us today as you've given it to me. Thank you, Father, for each and every person who will uh, tune in today, who will listen in today, Father. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you do some great and mighty things in your people and in the earth. <clears throat> Thank you, Father God, that you can make your voice known. Thank you, Lord, that you can amplify your voice as you so choose and you so desire to use whoever you so will. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for your kindness, and for your truth today. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Father, be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I don't want to say welcome to Daring Dialogues because I'm so used to saying that, um, but this isn't Daring Di Dialogues this morning. Um, this is actually just me sharing some things from the heart of the Father. And um, I'm going to take my time this morning because uh, I am. <laughs> so good morning to you all. Um, normally I'm on Periscope and YouTube, but I did send a notice to my YouTube viewers um, to join me either on Facebook Live or Periscope today. Um, but I will uh, hopefully upload this to YouTube later on today. So a lot has been going on in the uh, universal body. And I, first of all, I want to start out by thanking uh, pastors and thanking leaders who are actually um, stepping up to the plate to address certain things in the body of Christ um, and that they're not leaving a void um, anywhere. They're not leaving a void, so to speak, in social media or cyberspace uh, to address some of the things happening in the body of Christ. <clears throat> With that being said, um, I just want to appreciate all parts of the Ascension body. That's apostles, that's prophets, that's evangelists, that's pastors, that's teachers. And um, something that we're going to be reading today, just to help re-emphasize that they all work together. Um, there's no big eyes, there's no little U's, um, but we need every part of the body working together to mature the body of believers. So um, if you are on with me, I will be reading the comments, but I may not be responding to the comments um, until I get done with um, what the Father has given me to share. And if you have questions, please, uh, especially if you're on Facebook Live, drop your questions in the comments. Um, and I will try to get to those questions after the broadcast, only because the amount of things I have to share today, I know it's going to be lengthy. So, um, but I will, if you do put a question in the comment section on Facebook Live, I will try to answer that question to the best of my ability. And if I am not able to answer the question, I will let you know that. And then I will probably point you to somebody who would have that answer or that expertise. All right. So I don't claim <laughs> I don't claim omniscience or omnipotence or any of that. All right. So I'm just sharing what the Lord has given me from his heart. So <clears throat> over the past couple of days, um, I would say I started probably around Sunday of last week. The Lord began to uh, talk with me. And, that, and Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, up until Wednesday, I finally got a full night's rest uh, last night. <laughs> um, God would get me up and he would start talking to me about his body and some of the things that are happening in the body. And I did share 
um, just briefly with some apostles and prophets um, who are in agreement with some of the things that the Lord was sharing me because he's been sharing those things with them as well. So um, today I was released to share in totality what God was sharing with me. I want to start out by saying, for those of you who don't know me, <laughs> uh, I'm Googleable, so just Google me. Um, I want to put some disclaimers out before I begin, uh, because I think sometimes when people hear things that are being said or things that are being addressed to the body, they automatically think this person is coming from a bad place or this person is coming from um, some hurt or some wounds or anything like that. So I want to say I'm not a bastard. <laughs> um, I'm not an orphan. Um, I'm not mad at anybody. Um, I have uh, served and honored leadership. That's what I do. Um, <clears throat> I love God's people. And I also love humanity at large. Um, I try not to um, disparage humanity just because humanity, for the most part, has not come into a knowledge of Christ. Um, so I do believe in the value of every human soul, whether they have received Christ yet or not. Um, I have had very good pastors and leaders myself that I've been under. Um, I've had very good teachers, very good um, prophets that have uh I hate to say the word mentor because of what it means, but that have uh, taught me, that have prayed for me, that have equipped me. So <clears throat> I'm definitely, I'm not speaking from the perspective of someone hurt me and therefore now I want to get on social media and rant. All right. So, um, <clears throat> and lastly, I've never been a part of a church split and I don't intend to be. <laughs> All right. So I just wanted to put those disclaimers out there as I began um, to share the father's heart. So a couple of terms that God began to share with me. Um, one, he said tabloid churchianity. And of course, most of us know um, what a tabloid is. It's usually kind of that <clears throat> the gossipy. Um, drama filled magazines where certain things may be true or may not be true, but it's a, sometimes it's a little bit of both, right? It's a little bit of truth in, in with a whole lot of falsehood. The other thing he said to me was my ecclesia speak to my ecclesia. The other thing he said to me was, um, that there is a strong spirit of slavery and overlording, saturating the administration of leaders. Now, of course, you know, I had to go and um, kind of look at that. But that was the first thing that he shared with me. He said, there's a strong spirit of slavery and overlording, saturating the administration of leaders. And he said, there's a lot of preferences that do not have his backing. And we're taking our preferences and making them equal to the word of God <clears throat> and to the mandates of scripture. So, of course, as a leader, <laughs> I went into repent mode because I don't want to be I don't ever want to be the person that um, takes a position of leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, and tries to lord over um, people because that's not what God has called us to do. If you read um, John chapter 10, which we won't read today, but if you read John chapter 10, it kind of tells you a little bit about Christ, him being the shepherd. It talks about um, the hireling spirit and all of those things. It talks about people who abandon um, sheep talks a little bit about kind of people who um, don't care for the sheep properly. So I don't want to be in that category at all. So I repented. Um, and I can't tell what leaders, other leaders, how they should 
respond to this word, but I do believe that if you are a, a leader for God and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, then I know that you will respond to this word the way you need to respond to it. So as I began uh, throughout this week, he began to talk to me about the concept of freedom. And I know that even when we are addressing things that have to do with the body, sometimes um, we as leaders, we get into this mode where we say, um, I think that the people, the quote unquote people have gotten too much freedom. All right. And as I heard that, the Lord said to me, freedom is not an extreme. So you don't go from <clears throat> you don't go from bondage to freedom. For someone to turn around and say you're too free, what does that mean? Um, whom the sun sets free, right, is free indeed. It's not a cloak to commit unrighteousness, right? It's not a cloak to commit unrighteousness, but we are free in Christ. So what does that mean? And as I was asking the Lord that he said, freedom is not an extreme. It belongs to those that God has set free. Freedom is a part of the inheritance of believers. So as a leader, <clears throat> I should be teaching you how to operate in that freedom or operate in that lead, that liberty without saying, I need to make you captive to my preferences. All right. So I hope people understand what I just said. <clears throat> then the Lord said, said to me, there are a lot of abused leaders who have not processed their own abuses, who are discounting, downplaying, and deflecting from the very real abuse of others. I'll say that one more time. There are a lot of abused leaders who have not processed their own abuse, who are discounting, downplaying, and deflecting from the very real abuse of others. <clears throat> then he took me back to slave masters. What is it about slave masters? He said this, slave masters have a serious disdain for anyone's freedom except their own. Slave masters have a serious disdain for anyone's freedom except their own. So as leaders, we want to check ourselves. Good morning to everyone. We want to check ourselves and make sure that we are not operating in the spirit of a slave master. I'm going to go back and share one more time how this conversation with the Lord and I began, he said, there is a strong spirit of slavery and overlording saturating the administration of leaders. There is a lot of preferences that do not have his backing. It may be your preference, but it is not a command from the Lord. All right. Slave masters are free to subjugate while telling the people they are too free. All right. And from there, he said, the gospel of the kingdom is not fear inducing, but freedom releasing. I'll tell you that I'll say that one more time. The gospel of the kingdom is not fear inducing, but freedom releasing. So, we got to go back and we have to ask ourselves, are we ministering the gospel of the kingdom or are we ministering a gospel unto ourselves? All right. <clears throat> and as I began to ask him about that, he said a lot of times we we get into the spirit of legalism and 
sometimes we're trying to come out of legalism, but we might be coming out of legalism, but still engaging in churchianity, which is also damaging. All right. It's 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 a it's a fine line between legalism and churchianity. Sometimes we can think, oh, I'm free from legalism. But we're still engaging in things that become preferences. Then we use those preferences to hold people captive. And we say, if you don't do it this way, then God is going to get you. <laughs> uh one of the lady apostles who is on here today knows might might relate to this one. If you have color on your nails, you are not of the Lord or you are not anointed or you are not consecrated or you are not whatever. All right. That becomes a preference. That's as an example. That becomes a preference that we began to put up as a barricade or a blockade from receiving from people. Good morning. All right. So the Lord said freedom in Christ. When you have freedom in Christ and you're operating in the freedom of God. And this is something that the the body is operating in, in your assembly. When you have that freedom in Christ, it allows the father to drop his weight, his presence within a service. And you may just be standing there holding the mic. You might just be standing there facilitating people experiencing the freedom of God. Sometimes you may not get to your message because you're walking. There's a level of freedom that God has released in your midst. And leaders who walk in this freedom of Christ in Christ will tell you that sometimes they don't get to the message because God comes in and he begins to minister to the people. And so people leave out, not because we touch them, but because God met them in a place of freedom. Remember, the scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That means I don't have to manufacture liberty. That means I don't need stage lights to set a atmosphere for liberty. Not knocking the artist because I'm an artist myself. All right. But where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And if we're letting the spirit of God operate in our places, in a, the places where we assemble, then the spirit of the Lord comes in and it administers freedom to the people who are around us. So people don't leave out saying, oh, my God, the prophet touched me and I made whole. Oh, my God, the apostle touched me and I made whole. They leave out actually saying I had an encounter with God. The father came in and ministered to me. And the things and the burdens and the bondage that I came in with, I don't have those things anymore. So the other piece that the Lord said is that while Christ will return, he wants us to be encouraged that the kingdom of God is within us now. <clears throat> and because the kingdom of God is within us now, he wants us as leaders to make sure that we're helping people to understand how to live and how to operate as kingdom ambassadors now. Right. We're not waiting on uh, some of the things that we know we're going to we're going to receive in heaven. There's a measure that God has released to us now. I don't have to wait until my body goes in the ground six feet to experience the other side in the other part of God's presence. So how do we get there? How do we tell people that? How do we show them? And the Lord said, when people are taught about the kingdom within, when they are taught about the kingdom within, they will stop making idols of men. 
Can I say that one more time? Do I have permission to say that one more time? Okay. When people are taught about the kingdom within, they will stop making idols of men. All right. And here's the part that I believe a lot of people, especially leaders, are struggling with right now. And that is people will not stay in a institution that is broken. They will not want to stay in a place where God is clearly saying, Get into my kingdom. And if God is saying, get into my kingdom. And leaderships have not leadership has not moved from institution to kingdom life. If they've not moved from institution to teaching people about the kingdom of God. Their relationship to God in that kingdom their responsibility as ambassadors of a kingdom, their privileges as citizens of a kingdom. If we don't, if we don't move people to getting into the kingdom, then as the Lord put it in his terms, a slave revolt is on its way. It's on its way. And so The next thing he said was in his kingdom is his mantle in his kingdom is his mantle. And that mantle is greater than the mantle that someone wants to haze you over. I'm going to sip my orange juice and clear my throat for a moment. Say it one more time. In his kingdom is his mantle. And that mantle is greater than the mantle that someone would want to haze you for. Christ has a mantle. And I said, okay, Lord. What do you mean? People want to haze you for a mantle. He said this. He said, we keep reaching for flawed mantles, which Christ has offered us his perfect mantle 2,000 years ago. We keep reaching for flawed mantles while Christ has offered his perfect mantle to thousand years ago he said i told you to put on christ when you put on christ you put on a perfect mantle when you put on christ you don't get disappointed because you've been waiting for 40 years for someone to give you a mantle they have no intentions of giving you Some people are waiting for other people's mantles who are still using their mantles. Did you know that in Christ, everybody has a specific mantle? There are specific gifts, there are specific talents, there are specific skills that are attached to your mantle in Christ. And sadly, some of us forfeit the original thing that God would do in us because we're chasing after someone else's mantle. He said, you're trying to work for an imperfect mantle and Christ is saying, put me on. You don't have to wait for years and years to be affirmed as a son of God. Because God said, I do the the affirming. All right, 
I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> he said, a lot of sectarian and esoteric behaviors are being merged with ministry and God never intended his people to be devalued and the leader to be esteemed only. He never intended his people to be devalued and the leaders esteemed only. Some say, if you are overlooked, if you are abused, if you are um, harmed, that you should stay and take it. And he said, there's a difference between correction and abuse. There's a difference between training and equipping and abuse. There's a difference between teaching and hazing. Fostering a culture of enduring abuse and calling it correction is ungodly. Fostering a culture of enduring abuse and calling it correction is ungodly. Then he said, let me talk to my watchmen and my intercessors in the body. <clears throat> Make sure that you are building community, watchmen and intercessors. Make sure you are building community and not killing real community. Many people are being killed in the name of self-appointed watchmen. Many are being destroyed in the name of, I felt something in my spirit about this person, watch out for them. So if you're a watchman and you're an intercessor, make sure that your spirit and your motives are pure and that you're not looking at people through the lens of your hurt, through the lens of your offense, through the lens of past abuses, because you can begin to project onto someone something that is not on them or in them. And it's causing real damage because we are labeling people who come into our midst because we felt something in our spirit. All right? God says, I am not intimidated by the freedom that my people walk in. I am not intimidated by the freedom that my people walk in. Some say, I don't really think that you're delivered or I don't really think that you're free because I didn't see your tears. I didn't see your pain. You didn't demonstrate enough suffering to me. You didn't cry enough at the altar. I didn't see you rolling around on the floor. So I don't think you really received deliverance or received freedom. But he said, freedom is an inside job. Freedom is an inside job. Tears are not the sole indication of realness. Some people leap for joy. Some people cry in thankfulness. And some people are crying in pain. They're not free at all. You must use discernment when you're ministering to the people. You must use and operate in discernment when you're ministering to the people. As for power, Coming back to my church, 
he said. The power is not coming back to the church because I left it with my kingdom disciples. Again, the power of the Lord, the kingdom of the Lord is within you. It doesn't have to come back from anywhere. The kingdom of God is within you. So now the question is, what are you doing with the power within? He said, receive the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Some of you receive the Holy Spirit. Now he says, receive the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you. The Holy Spirit is not just there to make you happy, although he does. He's not just there to bring you a sense of peace and joy, although he does. He's also there to activate the gifts that lay dormant on the inside of you that you have yet to activate because you're waiting for someone to activate what God said you have to receive. <clears throat> now the Lord said, let me talk to my priesthood. My priesthood, he said, Jesus released you into a new priesthood 2,000 years ago. Are you 2,000 years behind? Somebody's going to say, what is she talking about? Let me go there. Hebrews chapter 7, if you have your Bible. Hebrews 7. He says, Hebrews, starting at Hebrews 7, verse 11, he says, If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise in the order of Melchizedek and not be described as being in the order of Aaron? For there is a change of the priesthood that must be, there must be a change of the law as well. For the one whom, about whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, from which no one has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and about that tribe Moses said nothing concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek arises who doesn't become a priest based on a legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So, whose priesthood are we operating in? Let's drop down to verse 22 and 23. So Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins and then for those of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. So, he introduced us to the order of Melchizedek.
All right. He said, many times we talk about minor things like they are major things. For example, we might be worried about people disrupting our congregational flow. Something like walking in a service. But we fail to address things like pedophilia and rape. We focus on the minor things like they are the major things. We'll discipline somebody for disturbing the altar call, but we won't discipline, we won't address the people who are doing damage to souls. So are we preaching the gospel or are we preaching plantation maintenance? Do we have a gospel of overlording or do we have a gospel of truth and freedom? He said, many say they want to bring back holiness, but what you're really saying is you want to bring back handcuffs. True holiness brings freedom. But preferences, legalism brings bondage. So the gospel presents us with freedom. And as God presents us with that freedom, we know that with freedom comes responsibility. With freedom comes responsibility. And if that is the case, then are we teaching people the responsibility that comes with freedom in Christ? Because the reality is, he said, that a taskmaster controls your life. They give you a prescribed set of rules. They tell you when to get up. They tell you when to sit down. They tell you when to wake up. They tell you when to go to bed. They tell you what to eat. They tell you who to talk to. They tell you who not to talk to. A taskmaster controls your life. They give you a prescribed set of rules. That's not freedom. You may be functioning but you're not functioning in freedom because with freedom comes responsibility. And when you have responsibilities, then you have something called accountability. And when you have accountability, then you have something also called editability. That means the ability for someone to come along and, and uh, let you know, hey, this is wrong. This needs to change. You need to grow here. How are you doing here? But someone who controls every aspect of your life is a taskmaster. We say things like, keep sacred things sacred. And it's a phrase that we often hear, especially if you come from um, a background of a holiness or Pentecostal um, background. One second. So we say keep sacred things sacred. But this is what the Lord showed me. We say keep sacred things sacred, but what we're really doing
What we're really doing is trying to scare people straight. And again, God has not released us into a kingdom of fear. He's not fear inducing. He's freedom releasing. And so what we keep shouting as sacred is really spiritual fear mongering. Because if I scare you enough into thinking that God is going to get you about everything, then you'll do as I say. So, are we talking about sacred things, leaders, or are we talking about man's traditions and preferences that we want people to follow without question? Your preference being made equal to God's commands is a problem. Oh yes, spiritual gaslighting. That's actually the term God gave me. So your preference being made equal to God's command becomes a problem. And then he said to me, some of us cannot tell when preachers and leaders are angry. They're preaching, but it's not the anointing that's preaching. It's their anger. They're angry. Um, <clears throat> some of them are shouting, but it's frustration that's shouting. It's not faith. It's, I wish people would follow my directions. And if they don't follow my directions, then I'm going to preach them and scare them straight. And I'm going to tack on, thus saith the Lord, in front of my preference. And then they'll do what I say. Some say, let's get back to the old school. Let's get back to the old school. Let's go back to the old ways. The Lord said, what if you grew up on, what if what you grew up on, the old ways, the old time ways, what if what you grew up on was not truth, but tradition? So we're saying, let's go back to the old ways. And we're not talking about the old landmarks of scripture. We're talking about the old ways that people did things to keep people in bondage. What if what you grew up on hearing was not truth, but tradition? So what if I'm sending people backwards because I realized that the methods that people used in the past kept people more securely under their thumb? Not necessarily in the Lord or in Christ, but it secured people in captivity. They might have been more respectful of the leader. They might have feared the leader. But again, the kingdom of God is not fear inducing. So when you say, let's go back, make sure you're actually saying, that you want to get back to truth. Did you need something from me? Okay. <laughs> Make sure you are returning to truth and not just the last landmark or tombstone of error. I'll say that one more time. Make sure you are returning to truth not just the last landmark or tombstone of era. Meaning, mm, 
Can everybody see that? Make sure you are returning to truth, not just the last landmark or tombstone of error. Here lies error. Let's not go pick it back up again because we felt more comfortable with it or because it controlled people better. There's a reason why it has a tombstone. We probably shouldn't go digging it back up again. All right. So what are we fostering? That's the question God asked me. What are we fostering? Are we fostering the sacred things of God? Or are we fostering fear amongst the people who don't do what we say? Preference. So some people say. What about my inheritance? I got to get my inheritance. I got to do everything they say in order to get my inheritance. I got to do everything they say to get the oil that flows from the head down the garment. What about your inheritance? Who does your inheritance actually come from? The Lord said, Jesus gave you an access. He gave you access to your inheritance 2,000 years ago. He's waiting for you to read the will and understand what your inheritance is so you can begin to claim that inheritance in the kingdom and begin to walk therein. Then he said, we're waiting on spiritual emancipation proclamations from people who have no power to declare you free. And the reason they don't have the power to declare you free is because Jesus already freed you. I know some people would be charging a thousand dollars right now for what I just said. The Lord said, if we minister to people and they come away with a works mentality, we did not do something right. Leaders. If we minister to people and they come away with a works mentality, we did not do something right. Here's what the Lord said. He said, you can't earn this. Because how many of y'all know? (laughs) Some of us have been disqualified from earning. You can't earn this. You cannot shine enough shoes. You cannot wash enough cars. You cannot chauffeur enough preachers. You cannot carry enough briefcases. You cannot wipe enough foreheads to earn this grace. Signed, your father in heaven. Jesus gives the anointing to liberate. But Satan will happily help some people as angels of light to enslave you. Then the Lord said, there are people dragging his name. He said, I will not allow my name to be dragged. 
He will not let his name go down in mockery. You might go down mocking his name, but he said, I will not allow my name to be dragged. So if you want to be connected to people dragging the Lord's name, that's entirely on you. So I said, okay, Lord, I don't want to be a part of that. I refuse to be a part of it. I don't care how people justify it. You won't see me mocking the Lord in no capacity. I want to have clean hands and a pure heart. He said, you're seeing the beginnings. People have known this for a while, but you are seeing the results of mass insanity, mass hypnosis, and mass hypocrisy. You're seeing the fruit of mass insanity, mass hypnosis, and mass hypocrisy. And let me just help some of you all out because let me see if I can draw it. Because I don't I don't even want to do the symbol. <laughs> let me see. Let me see if I can draw it. Bear with me, people. Bear with me. Appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's good enough. All right. You see this here? Everybody can excuse my quick drawing. All right, you see this symbol? This symbol is supposed to be the AOK -okay sign. All right. Lots of world leaders do this symbol. Unfortunately, lots of preachers do this symbol. This is a symbol that allows people to conduct mass hypnosis in large settings. All right. So when you see this symbol being employed several times, especially when people are talking it's a way to keep a large crowd's attention. It is a form of operating in mass hypnosis. All right. So I just want you to be aware that when you see leaders who were never using this before begin to use this, you will actually start to see their influence increase. Go look it up. You don't have to believe me. But it is one of the symbols that is used to conduct mass hypnosis. Moving right along. The Lord said he is raising up disciples and ambassadors who will bring his mandate and his kingdom and not their own agenda. He is raising up disciples and ambassadors who will bring his mandate and his kingdom and not their own agenda. On the subject of offense, this is what he says. Should you let offense stretch you? Should you take offense and ignore it? Should we just tell people to get over it? This is not sound. It is a form of gaslighting to deny people's reality and to deny people's experience and to tell them that what they're experiencing is not happening to them. We're watching this nationally. We're seeing it in terms of race but it also happens in terms of what happens to people 
under the auspices and under the care of the body and the assemblies that name the name of Christ. If someone slaps you, you shouldn't put blush on it. You shouldn't put blush on the bruise and say, God is stretching me. Can I say that again? If someone slaps you, you wouldn't put blush on the bruise and say, God is stretching me. So why do we tell people who have been harmed, legitimately harmed, to let it stretch them? It's gaslighting and it needs to stop. God is not stretching us through abuse. Do I need to say that again? I think I do. God is not stretching us through abuse. He said, I do not need abuse to anoint you. I do not need to abuse you to anoint you. I do not need to abuse you to speak to you. Again, <clears throat> these are measures of a taskmaster spirit masquerading as leadership. Church two occurs when people are being spiritually groomed for deception. The reason we have a church two hashtag is because people are being spiritually groomed for deception. And now it is happening on a massive scale. We now have masses of people saying, I was abused. I lived through it. You should accept the abuse too. You should be quiet about it. Don't make a ruckus. Don't make a noise. If you just accept it, you'll eventually be elevated, whatever that means, whatever context that can mean. But don't say anything. And what is happening is people are being spiritually groomed for deception and abuse. Many are being groomed to accept abuse. And a part of grooming people on a mass scale to accept abuse is to have mass amounts of people mock you into silence. I'm going to say that again because I'm not bright enough to come up with this, okay? <laughs> the Lord said a part of being spiritually groomed for deception and abuse is to be mocked into silence. Because now I know how many people would actually mock me if I came to you and told you what was really happening to me. So now mockery, what mockery does is mockery isolates people who actually have legitimate trauma and abuse going on. And so I don't want to be party to setting the stage for people to be spiritually groomed into silence and into deception and into abuse. He said, there are some who come into the body for the express purpose to corrupt it. Mm-hmm. There are some who come into the body for the express purpose to corrupt it. So are there people who enter in, who pretend to be of God, only to turn around? They know they had no intentions of ever coming into the faith, but they have gained the confidence and they have gained the trust of people. 
And now they're they're using their position in the body to bring a discrediting to Christ in his kingdom. Is that happening? Yes, it is. They engender sympathy while doing so. They had no intention of receiving the Lord. They are there to discredit Christ in his kingdom. They are there to do what is shameful and say, but I'm a Christian. So there are some who are in the body for the express purpose of corrupting it. For people to turn and look and say, see, I told you these people were not true. See, I told you these people were not godly. See, I told you these people were hypocrites. But the reality is some of them were never saved to begin with. And so what we're seeing is exposure. And the Lord said, exposure is the result of prayer, not the absence of prayer. So when people say, I want, we need to pray, we need to pray, we need to pray. We have been praying. Raise your hand if you've been praying. We have been praying. And we have been asking God to show us what is true and what is not. And we have been praying and asking God to show us uh, who is of the kingdom and who is not of the kingdom. And we have been praying and we've been asking God to help us to see what is wheat and what is tear. And we have been praying and we have been asking God, show us who not to listen to in this hour who is clearly anti-Christ. So right now, you're getting an opportunity to see how many people are actually anti-Christ. Exposure is the result of prayer, not the absence of it. Thank God for intercessors who have been praying to see this day. It's not a pretty day, but it is a day that must come because God said he's coming back for a bride who is spotless, without wrinkle, without stain. All right? So we can't get to spotless and wrinkleless and stainless if the dirt isn't exposed. I haven't seen anybody really uh, take clean clothes to a dry cleaner, right? You take it there because there are some spots on it. There are some stains. There are some wrinkles. In other words, it has a reason for going to the cleaners. So as much as we don't want to see the spots and the stains, we have to see them so that they can be dealt with. All right. And then the Lord said this. He said, sometimes we tell people we need to pray as a way to quiet criticism rather than heal and deal with the issues at hand. Sometimes we are only interested in praying for someone to quiet, to quiet the critics so we can continue to prostitute and gain from the gift. I'll say that again because I saw my screen freeze up um, for my Facebook Live. Sometimes we're only interested in praying for someone and quieting the critics so we can continue to prostitute and gain from the gift. We don't care. Some people don't care that people are uh, committing adultery or fornication. Some people don't care that people are not holding their, their vessel in honor, that they're holding it in dishonor. They only care about prostituting and gaining from the gift. So if the person is making them a lot of money, sometimes we say, well, we just need to pray for them as a way to quiet critics and not really address what's happening with the soul of the person. And will God deal with those? who are using gifted people like slot machines and lotteries and cash cows? 
Most certainly he will. When you've gotten to the point where you don't care about that person's soul and you're allowing them to do God knows whatever to destroy their souls because they're making you money, God is coming for it. Just thought I should let you know. We say we need to mind our own business. We need to mind our own business. This has been said many times. Some of us just need to mind our own business. Well, in what context? Because according to Ephesians 4, which I'm going to read to you, according to Ephesians 4, for the ascension gifts, the body is our business. Don't think so? Let me read it for you. All right. Ephesians 4. <laughs> Good afternoon to those of you who are coming on. He says this. Let me, let me start here. Ephesians 4, 11. It says, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry, wherever, wherever your ministry is in the world, to build up the body of Christ until... We all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. So why do we have all these people blowing around in the wind by techniques of deceit? Okay. But speaking truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together, by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. How are you going to tell me to mind my own business when we're connected? I told people the other week when I took a nasty fall, and I skimped up both of my hands and both of my knees, bruised my thigh, bruised my shoulder. Guess what? When I took that fall, all parts of me fell. My eyeball, my eyeball did not pop out and say, uh-oh, well, that's not on me. I guess I had nothing to do with that. Oops, look at them down there falling. No, my eye was a part of that experience. My skint up knees was a part of that experience. The bruise that's still recovering on my thigh, that was a part of that experience. So no, maybe my face didn't get scraped up. But my face was a part of that whole process. And sometimes because we look good in right now, we might not be dealing with something right now. The reality is my entire body felt the effects of that fall. Not one part of my body got, a, got an opportunity to excuse itself from the effects of that fall. 
And here's the interesting thing. My body had a natural desire and a natural inclination to go and heal the hurt parts. Uh-oh. My mouth did not start mocking my scraped knees. My mouth did not say, ha ha, oh, look at that knee down there, it's scraped up. No, my body went to immediate repair. It went to immediate first aid. It went to immediately say, how can I heal it? My brain started going into gear to say, what supplies do I need? I need some band-aids. I need some witch hazel. I need some hydrogen peroxide. I need an ACE bandage. So if we're connected and your response is not healing, I'm going to ask, are we connected? Because when the body is wounded, its natural response is to work to heal itself, not harm itself, heal itself. Somebody would have looked at me like I was crazy if instead of reaching for a Band-Aid, I reached for a sledgehammer and began to bang on my knee while my knee was scraped. You wouldn't see that as normal behavior. You wouldn't see that as healthy mental behavior. So when people tell me, mind your own business, I just want to remind you that for the Ascension gifts, the body is our business. We're in the business of healing. We're in the business of teaching. We're in the business of maturing. We're in the business of training. Why? We have to keep going because we're not all there. The scripture says, till we all come, till we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son. Okay. <clears throat> he said this, the Lord said this. Some have been so excited to share the shame of others and they won't even share my word. Some have been so excited to share the shame of others, but they won't even share my word. Hell is on a mission to discredit Christ and his kingdom. Will you be a part of the actions that discredit Christ? Or will you be a part of demonstrating that Christ is real? So what happened? Why do we have some who are bringing this shame? The Lord said this. He said, when we platform people without requiring them to transform, it is the fault of the leaders. When we platform people, when we give people an open door, without requiring them to transform. That is the fault of the leaders. What does that mean? That means the leader should not be going back and saying, I don't know what happened. He said, you do know what happened. You gave someone as the scripture said, you promoted a novice, which the scripture clearly tells us not to do. You promoted a novice and you didn't require them to transform before you promoted them and platformed them. 
So you platform them and then you backtracked and said, okay, now do this. It should have been in reverse. And the other piece is we created tools to platform people without requiring them to transform. We gave them the microphone. We told them they could audition. We didn't require people to be saved. We just said, we want your gift. We want your talent. We want to see what you have. We want to see what you're working with. And now when we see the results, we want to back away and act like we didn't play a part in it when we did. So for that, we have to repent. We say, especially uh, when we mess up, we say, leave this person alone. You can't talk about their sin when you sin too. You can't talk about what's wrong with them when you do dirt too. The Lord said to tell you, no one's sin is right. Nobody's. No one's sin is right. Doesn't matter who's doing it. Not a pastor, not our favorite people, not our best friends, not even ourselves. In other words, all sin should be addressed. And if we were addressing all sin, we wouldn't have people battling to say, well, you can't talk about my sin. Because guess what? No sin is right. So if I do something to harm my brother or my sister, if I do something to transgress, guess what? I need to repent too. This is not name that sin. This is not, I'm going to talk about this over here, but I'm not going to deal with this over here. No, everybody has a responsibility to walk in Christ's freedom and we have the responsibility as much as life within us to live free from habitual sin. And 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we sin, because we still live in human vessels, which means we're capable of sin. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But it doesn't mean that we go around saying, oh, I have an advocate with the Father, so let me do whatever I want to do. So no one's sin is right. No one's sin is valid. No one's sin should be justified. He said, why is my fatherhood not enough. Why is my fatherhood not enough? Why will you not get to know me as father, but you clamor for natural fathers. Why is my fathering, my fatherhood, not enough? And then he said, now I want you to talk to the self-medicating believer. The self-medicating believer. These are my believers who self-medicate to cover pain. 
Some of them use humor to do it. Some of them use their talents and their skills to do it. Some of them are not just creating just to create, but they're creating because they're literally creating to stay alive. They're singing, they're writing, they're playing is their life. It's a way and a method that they self-medicate with. So they're self-medicating and many are covering pain. Some are using sex to cover pain. When I heal them of their pain, their addictions will cease. Some are using drugs to cover pain. These are ways that my people self-medicate. So yes, even the hashtag, even the mockery is a coping mechanism. Yes, I want you to laugh with those who laugh, but that is not the same as laughing at those who weep. Say that again. He said, yes, I want you to laugh with those who laugh, but that is not the same thing as laughing at those who weep. He said, there have been two camps, two camps in the midst of my people. There have been character driven saints and there have been gift driven saints. Many have watched the gift driven get the spotlight. And now that the gifted are falling, the character driven saints are mocking them in the face of their failures. <sighs> Why are they mocking them? The embattled and character driven are mocking their hurt. They're denying it and saying it is not real. Some of them are saying good, that's what you get. And where does the mockery come from? The Lord said it too expresses the pain that the character driven has not dealt with themselves. The character driven have been ignored. The character driven have been sidelined because of the gifted. The character driven have been on the back burner because they were not a cash cow for the system called church. And so you have those who are, in some cases, the Lord said, making mockery of the gifted who have fallen because they feel like, hey, I've been ignored. I've been sidelined. I've been on the back burner. I haven't received any acknowledgement. And I've been here, much like the prodigal son who was in the house of the father, I've been here the entire time. How dare you accept the fallen back? How dare you accept an apology? I've been faithful this whole time. But have you been a son? Have you recognized that the father wants to bring you into sonship? Have you realized that you have an inheritance and you don't have to be bitter because you've been in the house unrecognized? The remedy is get in the kingdom. Understand the kingdom of God.
He said, there's righteousness, there's peace, there's joy in the Holy Spirit. The question is, will we get in the spirit to receive it? Will we get in the spirit to receive it? There was an era where we esteemed the evangelists. And then that esteem began to move on to the teachers in the body. And we began to esteem the teachers. It moved from esteeming the teachers, he said, to esteeming the prophets. We began to esteem the prophets. And then there was the rise of the pastors who began to criticize and silence the prophets. And now we have lots of criticism for the pastors as we are now esteeming and honoring the apostolic. When the reality is we need all of the ascension gifts. Now, we've tried to throw away the evangelist. We've tried to throw away the teacher. We've tried to throw away the pastor. We've tried to throw away the, the prophet. And now we're trying to throw away the apostles. He said, if you're throwing them all away, understand that the end goal is to throw away Christ and his kingdom. He said, I've called my gifts to a mutual honoring relationship. A mutual honoring relationship. And this is what he showed me. He said, many people believe that the kingdom looks like this. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's not uh, apostles are the biggest and the baddest and pastoring teachers are at the bottom. He said the kingdom looks like this. It's a lateral relationship. It's not a hierarchy. Now there are ecclesiastical structures that present as a hierarchy, but the kingdom is not a hierarchy. Lastly, <clears throat> he said, I'm raising up some who will know how to acknowledge and deal with pain. They will know how to acknowledge and deal with pain. They may not be theologically all together, but they can learn. But they will know how to acknowledge and deal with pain. Leaders, lastly, don't speak against something only because you want to shut out the person that you think is your competition. Don't speak against something only to shut down the person that you think is your competition. And I did ask the Lord to clarify. He said, don't speak against conferences and then go and have 20. Don't speak against prophets and then name yourself the prophet of your house. And no one else has an authoritative voice but you. Don't speak against networks and then go start one. Bottom line, stop the hypocrisy. Stop making statements because you're in competition with someone else. The Lord says, I see you. <laughs> I see you. So, in conclusion, let's check our minds, let's check our spirits, let's check our hearts, let's check our motives, 
Let's not be those who operate in the spirit of slavery and overlording. Let's not allow our preferences to overrule the spirit of God and the word of God. Let's teach people that the kingdom of God is within them. Teach them about the authority that they have in Christ. And as they learn about the authority they have in Christ, they will not make idols of men. And so I'm going to pray. And I hope that those of you who are on here right now will um, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share what you have shared with me. I pray, Father, that um, your leaders will hear your heart. I pray, Father, that everyone in your body would hear your heart, hear your mind, hear your spirit. I pray, Father, that those who have felt like they have been held captive, I pray that you have released your freedom through your words on today. I pray, Father, for your ascension gifts, that, Lord, we would be who you are calling us to be for the body, that we would not elevate ourselves or put ourselves in, the, in your position, that we would not allow men to see us as gods, that we would not allow people to worship us or to put us on a pedestal, and that, Father, we as your ascension gifts would work with one another, that we would not see ourselves as higher than another part of the body, but that we will see ourselves, Father, as a unified believers, as a unified leaders working together for a specific end. And that end is to mature people in you and to not build little kingdoms in Jesus' name. Father, we repent as leaders for ways that we have caused harm to your people and to your body. Father, we repent as leaders for not properly equipping people. Father, we repent as leaders for turning a blind eye to character traits and character faults, while at the same time elevating people because of their gifts and their talents. Father, we repent right now for um, any sins that you are showing us that we need to deal with in our own lives. And Father, we ask for your healing for those who are self-medicating, for those, Father, who are covering their pain, whether they're using their gifts to do it, whether they're using um, illegal substances to do it, whether they're using sexual activity and, and escapades to do it. Father, we pray for a deep, lasting, continual deliverance and healing in your people today. For you said, Lord, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. And Lord, as you are washing the pain away from your people today, if you're washing, as you are washing the pain from those who have been hurting this week, as you are washing away the pain, Father, from those who have not hurt, felt hurt this week, as you are washing away the pain from those who feel like they have been silenced and put on mute this week, Father, I pray that you would wash us thoroughly. Let your blood wash us, Father. I thank you, Father, that you have reasoned with us today. You have not condemned us. And we thank you for it, God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness that you have towards us. We thank you, Lord. We allow your Holy Spirit to have free rule and recourse in us. And Father, we allow you as our Abba to come in and father us, to come in and wrap your arms around us. We allow you, O oh God, to affirm us. Thank you, Lord, that we're more than a gift. We're more than a talent. We're more than uh, our abilities that we can bring to an assembly. But we are your sons and daughters. So we thank you, Lord. We just sit right now, oh God, and we receive your cleansing. We receive, Father God, your presence. We receive, Father God, your approval. We receive, Father God, your acceptance. For we are accepted in you. And Father God, 
I thank you for canceling every evil word, all the evil speaking, all of the negative words, Father. I thank you for canceling those things. I thank you, Father, for canceling that internal voice. I thank you, God, for shutting off those evil words. I thank you, Father, for shutting down the voice of the enemy that tells us that we are not good enough. I thank you, Father, for shutting down the voice of the enemy that tells uh, your sons and your daughters that nobody will receive them and nobody will care for them and nobody will honor them unless they are utilizing their gifts and their talents. And Father, I thank you for putting your hand on your artists today, your singers, your musicians, your visual artists, your dancers, your writers, Father, those who are uh, a part of the creative arts, those that may be struggling with depression, those that may be struggling with uh, burdens that have been placed on them. Father, those that have been used and prostituted and not treated as human beings, but treated as mules for the ministry. I thank you, Father God, for releasing them in the name of Jesus from the spirit of the slave master, the taskmaster, the overlord, in Jesus' name. I thank you for your great grace being upon your body, your assembly of believers. And I thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, Father, for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for your truth. Fill us up with your very presence. Let the Holy Spirit bring peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you again for your time and attention. I pray that you have a great an awesome and wonderful day today and take care and God bless.